Today, as we come into God's Word, we'll be in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, as uh, traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. Uh, appropriately, it would be the Disciples' Prayer, because they are learning to pray from Jesus. Je Jesus never had to pray, forgive us our sins. Jesus didn't need to say that. He was sinless. And uh, many of the requests in there, we see the three requests in the end of the prayer would not be specific to Jesus in entirely. Um, give us our daily bread um, on earth. He did. Uh, he could easily pray that, obviously. But I do want you to turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, if you would, please. I'm... Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 and following in just a moment. You know, a farmer, uh, by way of illustration, there is a certain farmer. He always wanted to be an evangelist. He just thought that would be the coolest thing. So he, uh, one day he was working out in the field and he was looking and he, he took a rest. He sat under a tree and looked up at the clouds and he saw P.C., and he's like, yes, preach Christ. It's a sign from God. So the, he sold his farm, went out, and became an evangelist. Well, the problem was he couldn't preach. Uh, it, did, it was just really sore. It just did not turn out very well. And one of the guys after the sermon, one of his neighbors said, maybe... PC stood for plant corn. <laughs> you know, sometimes we try to figure out the will of God in fuzzy and weird ways. You know what? God has revealed His Word for you. Everything you need for life and godliness, Peter says, is found right here in the Bible. First Peter tells us. Second Peter, either first or second Peter. Everything we need for life and godliness is right here. God's Word is sufficient. And we go to Him for His Word. We don't have to look at the clouds. You know, unfortunately... Uh, with that fella, he, he was looking for all the wrong signs to verify instead of um, uh, what would be the right course. You know, I believe the will of God, and I'll just set this out here ahead of time, is really shown in the fact that for, in Timothy it says, He that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. The desire's there, the qualifications are there, and then the church recognizes it and lays the hands on them. It's just very clear. It teaches us about the will of God. The will of God is not found outside of God's people in the church, the local church. The local church really should labor in prayer with you. Um, we should be sharpened as iron sharpens iron with one another. Um, that doesn't mean you broadcast all your sins to everybody in the church. It means trustworthy, wise counselors within the church. And there's times where certain things are just prayed for in general, for wisdom and the like. And God uses His body. <laughs> The program for this age is the church. It's not Israel. It's not a theocracy. We don't have a priest with the Urim and Thurim that casts that to decide things from the Lord. God has shown that church discipline, Matthew 18, very clearly said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be in their midst. That's in the context of the church congregation coming together. Really, God's will for the church is, our, for, for us individually, is found directly in His Word, in the council, and the family of the church acting biblically. Now, obviously, we can misbehave seriously in sin, and we don't want that to be the case. You know, God wants you to learn His will, not through experimental signs or experiential signs or superstitions, but through His Word, godly counsel, your local church, and submitting in prayer. Turn, if you would, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. I'm actually a start there. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we have just looked at the Word of God, you might be wondering, I would like to pray more, and that you should. And maybe you were even thinking, I wish I could pray more effectively. And you might be wondering, how can I 
see my prayers answered more favorably. The answer comes in verse 10. Did you see it? In verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. And, and we want to focus in on that phrase a little bit. Prayer is not about changing God, but in learning to ask, if you wouldn't conform to the heartbeat of heaven. You and I want to be ones that say, Lord, prayer is to be the act of me worshiping you and, and adoring you, living for you. And as I do that, Lord, I realize that I'm not going to change you. God changes not, the Bible says. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews tells us. You and I come before a holy God and say, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? As you and I come before God, we realize that we need to come before God. Lord, here's my planner for this week, this month, this year. Your will be done. Lord, I know you're going to revise this. I know that my vacation plans are going to get changed up a little bit. I know this, that, or the other thing. Lord, your will be done. And I just commit it to you. As I, we pray and seek Him for this, how does God want to change you? For you to pray correctly and follow God's will, I believe that this will be helpful. Let's see. Bring this up. And this is the part three of God's plan for your prayers. As we think about this, Jesus you, um, wants you to follow. It should have the word wants. Jesus wants you to follow His pattern. The adoration of God is to shape your petitions. It's to shape your petitions. The things that we ask of God. Godly prayers should shape you. They should grow you. You see, as you and I adore God, as we worship Him, as God, we say, God, hallowed be, you are holy, set apart, God, in all that you are. You and I want to come and we want to reflect on who He is. You know, last week we saw our, our we pray as a family, Father, God, you are, we have a special relationship with you. You're in heaven. You're not, you're distinct from this earth. You're, you're holy, set apart. Your name, everything that you are, and your kingdom that is to come, your, your, your physical, personal reign, the, and to sit on the Davidic throne, we look forward to those things. You know, exemplary prayer gives adoration to God by number one, submitting to the truth that His plans will ultimately, ultimately be perfectly fulfilled. And we say, Lord... Your will is what's going to get done. Lord, would you help me to grow and conform to it? Help me to look more like Jesus day by day. Your will be done. The word done there in the Greek has, can be done, performed. Lord, your will be performed. That's what's going to happen. And it's actually in the imperative. It's a, it, it will happen. It will be carried through. Where though? Here on earth. Lord, may your will be done on earth. How? As it is in heaven. Here, you see, God wants us to be ones that realize that the way heaven is, is the way we want things to be happening on earth. You know, you may, may tell your kids to clean up, but they might delay, defy, allow distractions or bad attitudes to taint their opportunity with sin. Now, I should say, kids, that's sin and that's wrong. But when God tells His angels in heaven to do His bidding, do you think they hold out? No. What does Hebrews 1.14 tells us? Are they not ministering spirits sent out to those who are the heirs of salvation? They are sent out. They do His bidding quickly, sweetly, and completely. And obedience should be done that way, kids and, and adults. We should be obeying quickly, sweetly, and completely. As in heaven, how do you think, you know, as we look about that, the angels, they're going to respond fervently, swiftly, readily, constantly to serve the Lord. And as I think about that, how do you pray about God's will? This is another question. Sometimes, as Christians... We think that God's almost holding out on us. And we're like, man, I'm just not getting my way. God, I really want this thing, X, Y, Z. And God, I really want out of this situation. And I want this and this and this. But you probably don't want that for me. Your will be done. 
Uh, do you know the tone in which we pray this makes all the difference? How are we approaching your will be done, God? Do we believe in a, in, a, in a way that embraces God? You know, Lord, I want to come in compliance with you sweetly instead of self-pity. You know what I think sours our faith a lot? Self-pity. Where we ask things like, you know, I want this, but I know you'd never want it. You probably just spoiler alert, you know, something of that nature. God does not want us, if you would, to have that kind of attitude. It says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, joyfully, sweetly, beautifully. R. Kent Hughes said this, we can say your will be done through an angry, clenched lips. But that's not heaven's tone. It is possible to say, your will be done in a funeral tone, a resignation and defeat. God, I want things my way, end of quote. How can you and I stop fighting God's will? Why don't our prayers get answered? Well, today I want to introduce uh, something here. James 4.3. The Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, said this, You ask and don't receive. Hey, do you feel like your prayers aren't answered? God says this is one of the reasons. It is an answer. Remember, when God says no, that is an answer. Your kids might not think that. Your neighbor may not think it. That Your fellow employee may not think that. But no is an answer. And God sometimes says no. Why? Because you ask amiss. You miss the target. You start praying and you're, you list off me, 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 me. Lord, this is what I want. And it's full of you. And God's like, there was nothing of me in there. There was nothing for others. It was tainted with you. And you may spend it on your pleasures, God says. You, you and I sometimes, we pray to get... Can I, can I warn you? I was just doing some... We do a Christmas gift exchange in our family. But you know what? I don't know about you. Every time at Christmas, I usually give this warning. Beware of getting. There's an aspect when, when are kids the most, what's the sometimes the most misbehaved day of the year? Some days it's Christmas. Be, why? Because it's all about getting. How do we change it to be about giving, to be about Jesus, to make it not all about us individually? How do we change our birthdays? Sometimes birthdays are, are kind of bratty days because what, do I have another gift? Do I have more, more, more? How do we help curtail some of that? You know, the amount of gifts and things are never the issue. It's will the heart be content? Are we content to say, your will be done? Lord, your list was sufficient. God, your gifts were good. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, from whom there's no shadow of turning or variableness. Do you remember James 1? We come to God and we're like, Lord, Lord everything's good. Why am I whiny? Why am I angry. It's because our angst builds up as we just want to consume. And that's exactly why God does not answer our prayers. God's like, I couldn't trust you with more. Sorry. You're like, what do you mean you couldn't trust me? Exactly. That's why he couldn't trust you. Because you thought you could. And because you wanted more and it'd lead astray. You know, as we think about this, this slapping, here's another thing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, a lot of times we think, well, John 14 says, verse 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, Jesus said. Now, a lot of times we say, in Jesus' name, amen. And that's appropriate. But have we kind of forgotten why we pray in Jesus' name? What's the whole purpose of that? 
As I think about this, John 16, 23 and 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, He will give it to you in my name. Hitherto you have not asked, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Did you hear that? God's like, I want your joy to be full. I want you to be enjoying me. I want you to be satisfied in me. And with that, we say, Lord, this is good. But do you remember how that uh, when Jesus is talking with the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin asked the disciples, sorry, the, uh, in Acts chapter 4, not Jesus, the Sanhedrin asked the disciples, I think that's Peter and John, they've just been, they're going to be arrested. By whose authority did you do this? Do you remember when they scold him that they, they do all the miracles and what they do? And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, by whose authority did you do this? When Paul rebukes the unclean spirit, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then goes on with a miracle in Acts 16, 18. What is it about in the name of Jesus? I think there's two clear things you can think, take away. One, you're praying, Lord... By praying in Jesus' name, we're praying on your authorization. God, if you give the order for this to go, it's on your authority, your authorization. Do you ever have to have something cleared with the boss and until his signature gets put on it or timed or dated or whatever happens to be, you can't go forward with that project or that order? Here, in one way, we're putting our prayer before God in Jesus' name. God, when, when you answer it, it'll be okay. It will be taken care of. It'll be authorized. The other thing is in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5, chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. We have confidence that He hears, and we know whatever we ask, but how is it to be asked? According to His will. A lot of times we make the will of God kind of this weird, mysterious thing. It's not mysterious. It's right here. All of the moral will of God is right here. His permissive will allows different courses of action. You think of, had the works been done in you, Sire and Titan, would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Do you remember? If it had happened. But it didn't happen that way. God knows every purported course of action. He is completely sovereign. But there are things He permits. He permits you to choose whether you're going to obey or disobey. His moral will is that you never disobey. But His permissive will says you have this freedom. His sovereign will or decreed will, we see in like Romans chapter 8, from foreknowledge to glory, He has made things decreed. With all of that, we say, Lord, your, your will, there's aspects of it that are, that are mind-blowing, but they're all good. And as I think about God's will being completely good, we will bring to that point two things. One, your will be done. We're saying, God, I submit to your sovereignty. Your will be done. God, I submit to your, des your sovereign desires and determination. That's what we're praying Lord, I'm waiting on your authorization. God, I'm, I am giving this to you based upon your will be done, what's consistent with your character. And then there's another thing for us to remember. It's this, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your, what? Reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God. Did you see what the will of God was on the end of that verse? 
good, acceptable, and perfect. The will of God is good. Do we believe that? God, here it is. I know you'll make it better. How much of the time would our prayer life change if we embrace God as truly good and say, God, if you don't authorize this, hallelujah, you, you had a better plan. Lord, if you put rejected on this prayer request, the timing wasn't right. Whatever it was, Lord, it was not meant to be. Lord, I'm going to trust you more than my dreams. I'm going to trust you more than my feelings, my hopes, my desires. Because you didn't give the authorization, Father. And that's what we want to rest in, that He is all good. He's completely good. You know, I really appreciate this. Warren Wearsby commented on this, this little word, good. He's like, God's will comes from His heart. It's individual and personal. The more we do the Lord's will, the more we enjoy the Lord's best blessings that have been tailor-made especially for us. Do you believe that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? Do you believe that the, He is for your good and not for your evil? Do you believe He's better than an earthly father who would not give you a stone or a snake when you ask for bread? How much more your heavenly father? We're going we're to see that at the end of this chapter. Your Heavenly Father is so incredibly good. Now the word good is other-minded for your benefit, your highest good, your highest benefit. God is vested for that. And we say, Lord, you can X out as many of my prayers as you would like. Lord, thank you for everything you've given and everything you have not because you know better. What if we added that to our prayers? God, you know better. Are you whining, Christian, to God about what you don't have? Why don't you ask Him, Lord, you know better. Lord, trust Him. Lord, I know you know better. I'm going to rest in that. Well, we've got another thing here. You should test and approve what is the will of God. The word approve, um, or the word prove here, what it, in our passage in Romans, has the idea of... Say, I'm trying to locate at the moment. Reasonable service. You and I, oh, that you may prove is the word test, to discern, to find, and to follow. You and I are, we're trying to find out what's good and accept, but we know God's will is, is what's good. And we're trying to find out, God, what's in your word? That's where your will is always determined. It's always where it's shown. That is where it's revealed. You know what? We learn, someone I, I had a good discussion with this week about trials. Oh, and my, and my kids, so we had devotions and was talking about what are trials, what are they supposed to pr produce in us? James 1, Romans 5, they're to produce patience, the old King James, perseverance, the NASB renders it, endurance in some of your translations, steadfastness in another translation. God wants you to learn endurance. I asked one of my kids this week, I said, so if you were to run a big race, but you never ran before, how well would you do? And my kids did this illustration. Dad, we'd be like this. <laughs> so, and they're right. We would be just falling on our feet. We wouldn't have any gas to make the distance. And you and I need to be ones that say, Lord, I need gas for the distance, so you're going to build in me endurance. You're going to toughen me up. I know that sounds a little bit like John Wayne, but it's, that's actually a biblical thing. Grow in perseverance. Don't quit. Grow. That's God's whole intent for you, is that we would grow. You know, Psalm 119, verse 67. This is so beautiful. Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. God's like, you had to afflict me. You allowed trial to produce in me what it needed to, that I would obey. Isn't obedience the reward of a sweet conscience knowing you did the right thing? Went the right course? There's no sweeter pillow. Well, I think of this next point here. God's will is not only good, acceptable, and perfect. You've just seen that. Good, acceptable, and perfect. 
But we want to look at Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, that the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, the scripture says. For who has known the mind of the Lord, verse 34, who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him... And through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Four things to take away from this little passage. Verse 33, Wearsby said this well, Don't try to explain God's ways. Faith living without scheming. Faith is living without scheming. Like, Lord, you're, this is your will, and I'm just going to walk in it. That's what we do. Verse 34, don't try to change his mind, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Don't try to change God's mind. You know, how much of the time do we act like we're trying to inform God? God, if you could just look into Cindy's heart, you would see she's really broken up. Does God need you to inform him? No! He is the all-knowing one. He who's known the beginning from the end, the Alpha and the Omega. No, God's not short on any knowledge. You and I don't have to convince God, nor or should we try to argue with God for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or can we be like Job in chapter 40? Or who has been his counselor who can counsel the Lord? Well, look on verse 35. And it shall be repaid to him. Don't try to buy God off. Boy, I find Christians doing this all the time. If I go to church this much, I've got this many brownie points to get me through this week. You could miss church for a year and not get those brownie points. I'm sorry. Um, it's not a point system. It's obedience to the Lord. We want to obey Him out of love for Him. We trust Him. That is where we go. Verse 36, To whom be glory forever. Don't steal God's glory. Let Him have the bragging rights. Let Him be the one that's boasted about. Remember the works of the Lord and make known. Extol Him as we saw in Psalm 30 this morning, the call to worship. Next, we see another phrase in our passage in the Lord's Prayer. On earth as it is in heaven. You know, God... Would you fully accomplish your will on earth in the same way that it is followed in heaven? We talked about the angels, how they do his bidding. They're sent out to and fro through the earth there to do his bidding. And as I think about that, this is, this as in heaven, what we're praying, Lord, would you help me to be Holy Spirit led? How good would it be if your prayer request started in heaven and made full circle? God, would you by your spirit teach me to pray? What did the disciples say? Lord, teach us to pray. What if you and I started coming before God and said, God, give me the request you want me to pray this week. God, what do you want me to see done that I can watch your hand in, that my faith may increase because of your immense involvement and in goodness? Lord, bring it full circle. Lead me in the way I should pray. As it, on earth as it is in heaven. David Jeremiah said this, Prayer doesn't change God. When we pray, get on the same wave, we get on the same wavelength as God. And as we pray, if we pray according to the will of God, little by little, He takes the things that are out of sync and He puts them in sync. God, if you would, is helping us to, to be in sync with Him. And you and I can breathe with a great sigh of relief. Oh yes, this is the way it is supposed to be. You know, we always say hindsight is twenty twenty. When are we going to believe that praying without answers will be twenty twenty? Because God's got everything into perspective. On earth as it is in heaven, God, you've got the whole picture in line, all of eternity. 
you know, angels don't debate God. They joyfully, enthusiastically obey without conditions. Did you know there's... Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud. There's no workers' union in heaven where the angels are protesting God. Those angels got kicked out, remember? With Satan, one-third fell. That's not a good scenario. Well, all right, next thing to consider is this. And I have to credit Adrian Rogers for this. You know... Do you know the difference between American Christianity and the underground church in many communist countries? Uh, one underground pastor said when he was asked this question, What's, what is the American church about? And he says they're about commitment. Do you know who commitment? And Adrian Rogers returned and said, well, what's wrong with the word commitment? Isn't commitment a good thing? He says commitment is a good thing. But the problem with the word commitment, it's really come into a lot of usage in the church in America in the 1960s to the present. Present. He's like, what's wrong with that? He said, here's one of the problems. Every time a new word comes in like that, it displaces another word. Do you know what it was? Surrender. You know, I could actually go back in my library. I have books from the 1940s and 50s that were used in our Bible colleges and across America. The Crucified Life. Great book. Um, and another book by that Maxwell. He was Prairie Bible Institute. And there's uh, just a ton of material about the crucified life. But you know what? We've lost a lot of that. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Surrender. That's not... That doesn't sound like a life that's about self-expression. Isn't that what we're supposed to be able to do right now? Christian, as I challenge us in this, I think you and I need to realize that there's a difference between commitment and submission. You and I are subjects of the Most High God who bought you with a high price, His precious blood, so that you and I might be saved, so that you and I might live for Him gladly, dutifully. And so we want to be careful that the focus not be on what we do, but who He is and how we're to serve Him. You know, by way of application, don't let God's will be abstract for you. Pray that you would do God's will. Read the Bible. Apply it in your prayer. When you read through your Bible, look at your Bible and say, God, hallowed be your name. Lord, you're to be holy. Help me to remember to call you holy. Lord, you are so set apart. Just take a moment and think about your verses and talk back to Him. God wants to hear you think about Him in a good way. It blesses Him. It, it, it extols Him. It makes Him great instead of me great. Well, think also on this. Submissively ask with uh, help with God's commands and ask for wisdom to imitate examples of faith in the Bible. The will of God is found in biblical examples in the New Testament church as well. Prayer is about worshiping and knowing God. Prayer is also to grow you to become compliant. God guides the meek. Oh, that is a cool verse. Psalm 25, verse 9. He loves it when we're humble, when we're broken, when we're meek before Him. That is the, the desire of God's heart. Next, pray through your priorities. Always personally bringing them, submitting them to God to refine or disregard. God, sorry, this one got canceled, okay? Uh, plan B, Lord, what would that be? <laughs> well, what did you want for me? You know, as, your part, as you partner with God in prayer, let His love transform and deepen your love for Him, His children, and for the lost. And I appreciate David Jeremiah also said this, learning to pray God's priorities into my life has been one of the most exciting things that God has taught me to in my walk with Him. It has reduced the levels of fatigue, frustration, and failure in my Christian life. Would you like that, Christian? He says, it's saying, God, here it is. Here's my work week. You take it and improve it, Lord. You cancel what you would have. I don't know how many times Tara and I have over-scheduled ourselves. There have been numerous times, 
numerous, numerous times this year. Like, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And someone calls in sick. Someone calls in and cancels out a counseling appointment. Someone calls in and cancels an evangelistic Bible study. And I'm like, Lord, only you could work this schedule out. Lord, I was just trying to do as much for you as I could, but it was too much. Thank you, Lord, for rearranging this schedule. And you say, Lord, whew, thank you. As we come into this, we remember... I can either do my will, David Jeremiah says, or I can do God's will. And in the doing of God's will, there is an excitement and adventure. God, what do you got for me now? Then I might please you. Then I might walk joyfully and rejoice always. One of the problems is sometimes you and I are task-oriented You know, like, Pastor, isn't that responsible to be task-oriented? Yeah, there's, there's good in that. But are you submitting your to-do list to God? That's where your task orientation has to be reined in by one who is to override, who is to authorize. Let God rearrange it, move some things around, and liberate you to pray His priorities. Our second point is this. It says three, it's supposed to say two, but exemplary prayer gives adoration to God by worshiping Him as worthy of power and glory that He deserves. By worshiping Him as worthy of power and glory that He deserves. That first phrase there in verse 13. Let's look again at verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're going to come back to that next week. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. For yours is the kingdom. And we already saw how that your kingdom come. We prayed for that as we saw last week. Basically, God, I am closing my prayer with worship. God, I worship you as being in control. I recognize your universal sovereignty and how you rule. And may you be praised. I love Daniel 4, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Daniel 4, the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he wills, whoever he will, and sets over the lowest of men. God is ruling over kings, autocrats, you name it, the superpowers of the world. God does rule. Not only Nebuchadnezzar, but in our epic of time as well. When we see character and uh, all kinds of moral flaws, sinful flaws in our leaders, you and I need to remember, for God's sovereign reasons, He has put men into place. He sets kings up and He takes kings down. We remember, Lord, there is more to this story than what meets the eye. Lord, there is going to be a coming day of tribulation and everything has fallen right into place. Lord, you're right. And I trust you. Lord, the kings of this world, why do they rage? They imagine in vain things. Why do they do this, Lord? Because a godless rule is beastly without him, as Daniel illustrates. But I want to keep going on. As we think on our God, we said, Lord, I know, first of all, you are in control. You know, Lord, I'm not wanting to live based on this, cha this chaotic world, but based on who is in control. Thank you for canceling that. Thank you for allowing that, Lord, because I don't understand. But I know that you're good. With, we think, and Lord, because you are so good, we trust and rest in you. Next, we see the power. And the power. Lord, we come before him and we say, Lord, um, prayer and praise clearly go together. You are to be worshipped as the one who is to be honored, to be extolled. And, and I just rest in that. You know, we think of this in Luke chapter 137. Do you remember the angel Gabriel told to Mary, for no word from God will ever fail. God, God's in control. He is able not only to limit uh, others' power, but to set things up to allow the sinfulness of men to bring about His will, to be wedded to His good and perfect will. Well, not only do we see the power, but we also see the glory. And, you know, 
I don't know if any of you have uh, read some of those who's who in American colleges and schools and who's who in society, but um, why? What, what's, we set men up, but how long does it last? How impressive is it? If you were to go back to the who's who's list, did you know it existed in the 1600s? You wouldn't recognize a single one of them, hardly. A few of you might recognize one or two, but that's it. <laughs> like, you wouldn't know these guys. And as I think about that, we need to remember, you know what? Lord, for yours is the glory. Lord, you're the one that should be bragged on, boasted about. It's, it's you. Lord, I want to end this prayer just thanking you so much for all you've given. Never forgetting, God, thank you for bringing me through cancer again. Or the last time. God, thank you for giving me this or that. Never lose the luster of thanksgiving and worship. At the same time, when we say, but I don't understand the will of God, Pastor, we don't have to. There's another aspect. Do we realize that sin, death, and the curse are real? And that death is 100% for every one of us. We really struggle with that. You know why? Our medical society almost advertised like you can find the spring of life through their pill. It, it, if you didn't advertise that way, you wouldn't sell. We try to sell being invincible. You read silly accounts of millionaires, billionaires trying to get longer life and this, that, and the other thing. And if you only take B vitamins three times a day plus this, that, and the other, and add a little zinc to that, you might die five years younger. I don't know. I, I mean, you just, uh, you name it, trust the Lord. Take good care of yourself. But realize you and I live in very frail. Your life is but a vapor, the Bible says. Moses says it's like the grass that grows and withers and is, is taken away. It's gone. Um, and we just have to remember that. You know, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10 says, For yours is the kingdom of God. You're completely in control. I rest in it. And look at how long it is. It's forever. It doesn't end. This is awesome. This is encouraging. Lord, this is an everlasting... Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Psalm 145. And think of many of the words forever in the Bible. That we will enjoy the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. 6. The Lord's love endures forever. Psalm 136. He is faithful forever. Psalm 146, verse 6. And if we have been faithful, we will receive a crown that will last forever. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Hebrews 10, 14 says, Through Jesus Christ we have been made perfect forever. Boy, that is encouraging. Lord, you have forever in your hands. And then our last one, we see amen. When we say amen at the end of a prayer, we're saying, God, so be it. Your will be done. It's saying, it's amen is similar to the word for belief and trust, faithfulness, something being certain. That's what we're saying. Lord, let it be. You know, there was a, a little girl who prayed. And she's like, when I say amen, can I just use RSVP? And you can look up the original meaning of RSVP. And basically, Lord, if it pleases you, return this. Let this be return mail. Do you know, you and I pray every time, God, RSVP, if it be in your will, let it come back. End of story. Too much of the time, we don't submit it as a, a willful RSV. We're like, it's a willful demand. God, you do this for me. God wants to refine us in our prayer. Let's go ahead and close.